Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. I sound different. There's no video on YouTube, audio only this week, uh, because I am not at home. If you missed the news, uh, there was a burst drain pipe above my den, which is my home theater. Uh, that is why there was no episode last week. Uh, flooded my entire apartment. All of my belongings had to be removed. All of my laminate floor is going to have to be taken out and replaced. Uh, so it was drying out all last week. Um, yep. they, they got out the carpet. They got out the affected part of the laminate. Not all of it yet. Uh, got out the affected part of the drywall and everything. Uh, plumber's not coming back until this Thursday to get all the drain pipe finalized and permanent. So it has been an ordeal. I am very fortunate, though. I've been able to stay with my parents. So that keeps costs down. Uh, they, they are quite local to me and not too far from work. So it, it uh, hasn't been too bad at all. Uh, I don't know, maybe a couple more weeks to go, two, three weeks more to go. I don't know how long this is going to go on. Um, if for anyone who was curious... Uh, I know for sure that my OLED uh, definitely got impacted. One AV receiver, not my primary AV receiver, but a, another AV receiver got uh, drain water in it. So I don't imagine that did too well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had like a, a Behringer DSP that got saturated. So I imagine that's probably gone. And then a couple of my Ascend speakers definitely got like hit by it uh they might still be totally functional because they're speakers and they weren't playing when it happened uh but uh given that it is drain water uh, i'm not too sure i would uh, like you know oppose replacing that well you always know when they're when they're playing because the, you can smell it <laughs> smell the that's, air coming off the woofer <laughs> gonna gonna be a factor so anyway i'm doing fine uh things are fine but the podcast for Whatever's going on, it's going to be a mess for a while. Apologies that we missed last week. Obviously, unplanned hiatus. Uh, and apologies to Lee Overstreet, because I, I actually promised him, because Tom was planning to be away last week, and I was going to record with Lee. And I said, Lee, uh, you know, we've said before that uh, Tom might be away, and, and I might need to record with you. And it's been like Lucy pulling away the football. And I said, uh, Lee, I promise you lots of warning. Tom for sure is away next week, so it's not going to be a football poll. And then, of course... Uh, it was a football pool on uh, on uh, Leo Street there, so uh, uh, yeah, that that's how it's all gone, and I think that explains it. <laughs> well, you know, he won't stop talking about Roll Tide or whatever that crap is on Facebook, so he gets what he gets what he gets. <laughs> I was out last week because I was moving my son into college that day. So right. I, for those of you that want to know why I wasn't going to be there, I don't mm. think anybody cares. But yes, I was out moving my son into college and you know helping him set up his room and taking him to lunch and generally making, you know, making it uh, less comfortable for him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's just, you know, would rather me be gone, I think. So, yes, uh, before we really get onto the podcast and the things that we've watched and everything else, uh, I want to talk a little bit about this IO Gear Professional Online U uh, UPS uh, review that I did over at uh, AV Gadgets. So we're going to link that up in the, in the show notes. And in fact, if you want to see any of the images that we're going to be talking about this week, you're going to want to go to the show notes at avrant.com and click on the Flickr album. Yeah, okay. I, I am sort of uh, putting them into uh, what what is going up on YouTube, which is just going to be our, our, our names and a uh, question at AV Rant there. Uh, it's where you can send your emails. So uh, it is possible to view them on YouTube, but it's not going to be much of a viewing experience this week. Right. That's okay. <laughs> uh, so let's uh let's talk a little bit about this so ever since apc stopped making home theater specific uh ups's right. and battery backups and power conditioners we have been waiting for something to come out that kind of filled that void because mm -hmm. there is nothing you know the, everything that we suggest now are all these stand upright computer uh really more uh computer focused ups's so there's a lot of people that have been asking me in general like where can what is the next you know when's apc going to come out mm -hmm. with something or when it what is the alternative and for well, apc it's really just a form factor thing that they yeah. have the the gaming performance series that we've re uh recommended frequently but the form factor on that is like it's meant to be vertical so if you're trying to right. put it into a gear rack it's possible to lay it on its side but it's just not you know designed to natively go that way but here is an alternative right. from a different company 
Right. So I, IO Gear reached out to me and asked if I was interested in reviewing their, their piece of gear. So it comes in a couple of different flavors, and it all depends on what uh, you know what uh, how much power you want out of it. So they're all the GB GBB some number and then N. <laughs> so the number is either. 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, or 3,000. And hmm. basically, that's the max amount of power it can put out at any you know, watts at any given I would time. imagine that, yeah, volt amps probably. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, like, I, they sent me the 1,500, the mm-hmm. GBB 1,500N, and it puts out, at, it, it can put out in one burst 1,450. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what it can do. So did I test that? No, I didn't test that. How, how do you even test that? I mean, I don't have that kind of gear. Mm. So uh, this thing is more, this is, it's really geared towards uh, professionals. Okay. Mm. So this can go to like, I, I honestly believe it can go to any country and, and still work. It doesn't have the right power plugs on the back, but you know, it has so much configurability in within the menus and all the menus can be accessed in one of two ways. You can access it from the front panel or you can access it from a, you know, a computer interface. Basically you can log it, you can plug into it and log into it. There's, it's got more configurations and more configurability than I can understand and <laughs> or care to understand and will ever need. So I took it from the perspective of a enthusiast, which is what everybody who listens to this podcast is. We're, we're enthusiasts who care about this stuff. So, you know, how would I use this? And, you know, I live in Florida, so I plugged it in, plugged in my projector to it, because, of course, that's what I'm going to do, and said, okay, I'll finish hooking the rest of this thing up later. Within 30 minutes, we had a power out. Oh. <laughs> so I was like... Like you planned it. I was like, okay, well, it works, right? I mean, like, <laughs> out of the box, just plugging it into the wall, plugging the projector into it, it works, right? It, 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 it so the, the the kind of claim to fame of this thing is that you can you know out of the box the way it is it is set up you, it is always powering your gear from battery mm-hmm. so the battery is always running all of your gear so it's, so they would it's, call that an online uninterruptible power supply as opposed to in line which right. cuts over to the battery only when the power goes out this one the battery's running all the time yeah and it's nuts man so uh, there is no chance that you're going to lose power to your gear because it's always on battery power anyways uh which is great but it's also like uh it it, you know it keeps the battery constantly in use and it shortens the lifespan of the battery uh there are additional battery units that you can buy that Mm -hmm. are cheaper than buying another full unit uh, that will increase the amount of power that you have, so that the longevity of or how long you can keep your gear running. It's you can you can add those things to it while it's going without interrupting the power to your gear. You can hot swap the battery that's in it as long as the mains power is still is still there, and you won't have to turn your gear off or anything else. I don't know how mm-hmm. you're going to do that with if it's not in some sort of ex, you know gear wrap that gear, gear wrecking you can access, but you can do it. Uh, <laughs> But it also has an eco mode, and that eco mode interests me because, as th- this would be more like what you would expect a battery backup would, would work with is mm-hmm. you're on mains power most of the time, and then if something happens to the power, it switches over to the battery right away. And I thought, aha, that's where it's going to fail. That's where I'm going to trick this thing, and it's mm-hmm. going to because my projector has always been like the, every battery backup I've used with it, this particular projector. It's so it's so sensitive to power fluctuations that it shuts itself off immediately, hmm. and hmm. Uh, the power comes back, and you know if it's just a little flicker, the power comes back, and uh, or it switches onto the battery power. The everything else is still powered on. The you know anything else that's plugged into it is still powered on, no problem. But the projector will turn itself off. So I t- turned on the eco mode so that uh, so you know basically it. it it increases the longevity of the battery that you have, uh, but you're on mains most of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, you know, I think I took a picture of it and left that. So you can, it's got a little graphic. It shows which direction every, all the power is going. And I was like, okay, I'll just wait for the power to flicker again because it does it all the time. Well, of course, <laughs> in rain for like two weeks. And I'm like, okay, well, this you is can stupid. pull the plug out of the wall. That, that would simulate a power. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not that convenient because okay. It, it, okay. It, of where my plugs are. <laughs> so I just went outside and flick the breaker off. Oh, that's another way. <laughs> so I, my, I was, I had my kids in here and they were watching TV. And I flicked the power off and uh, nobody screamed. So that was a good, mm. that was a good sign. 
uh, I walked in and they were all still watching stuff. The remote stopped working because I forgot to plug the Harmony Hub into it. Oh, right, right, right. But uh, everything else worked fine. Uh, it was still going just fine. And I was like, you know what? Let's just see how long, how long I, you know, I can keep it going like this. And then I thought, well, because I had my receiver plugged into it, which is something that most people are like, I'm not sure if I'm going to plug my receiver into it because how much power it draws. Uh, I turned my system up to reference and let it run for, let it run for like half an hour. Like I turned it up to zero and just walked out of the room, kicked the kids out, walked out of the room, turned some loud movie on, you know, like just to simulate a movie night. Mm-hmm. And I came back in and I, like a half an hour later, it was like, you you used 12% of your battery or something. It was, it was really low. It was a Ooh. low amount uh, for being at reference level. Yeah. So I was really quite impressed. Now, this it's not a cheap unit. Um, I think they start at, ooh, I'm going to have to look at the review to remind myself. I think this one was, the 1500 is like seven, 750 bucks. Okay. Um, That's not as high as I was guessing in my head that it might be. Yeah, so I think it's right around there. Uh, so it's not super cheap. The downside is that this is meant to be in a rack mm-hmm. in another room or farther away from you. Okay, okay, so it has a fan, yeah. and the the fan is a fan in the front. There's a fan in the back, and it pulls air all the way through the thing mm-hmm. constantly. Which, if you have an APC that has or any sort of other battery uh, backup that does the, uh, you're on mains power until the battery kicks in. Yep, it will. There will be a fan that will kick on almost immediately. So you should be kind of aware of that. There's going to be noise if the battery is involved, and the yes. battery is already always involved in this one. Right. So there is uh, some fan noise. How loud is it? Well, I, I sit like six feet away from it. And as if there's nothing else going on, I can hear it. But mm-hmm. if there's anything else going on, I can't hear it. It is mm-hmm. akin to the, 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 the fan noise I get off of my projector. Okay. Uh, it's, that's pretty good. That's not bad at all. It's not, it's not nothing, yeah. but it's not loud. Right. Like my ceiling fan when it's acting up is louder than this thing. Because my I have an old ceiling fan and it's sometimes <laughs> the you know grind a little bit or whatever up there. Sometimes it's fine and sometimes it's it's not. So um, yeah, this is uh, I I was very impressed. I yes, people are like oh well the APCs were cheap. Yeah, they, okay, they were they were cheaper you know back when they were out, but they're not around anymore and mm-hmm. you can't get them. So this is the alternative. Um, if you're not sitting too close or you're not really too worried about a little bit of fan noise, or if you've got your gear in another room or you just wanted something that's rack mountable, this thing is rack mountable and you're like, well, well, I like the stuff that stands up. This thing can be, it comes with like feet Mm -hmm. so that you can stand it up and the little display like rotates 90 degrees. (laughs) So it will, it will be in the right orientation and everything. So, uh, I really, I mean, I think until somebody comes out with something cheaper, I don't think there's going to be anything better Mm. if if that makes any sense like i don't see any way that you could do any better the eco mode works great Mm. like it it doesn't make any noise when it clicks when it when it goes over like i sometimes notice that it's oh we're on mains power or whatever but even when you know it's on full battery mode while my while my system's going i'm never it's never putting out more than 10 or 10 percent of its available power Mm -hmm. to my gear i've never noticed it maybe higher than 10 or 12 percent so it's uh yeah it's just a testament to how little amplifier power we actually (laughs) need in our home theaters a little transient first that's about (laughs) it right oh and then i asked them specifically about uh plugging a subwoofer into the thing Mm -hmm. and they're like well you generally don't need to because subwoofers have their own protection i'm like yes i know mm. but could i mm. like well you have mm-hmm. to make sure that the maximum draw from the subwoofer does not exceed the the the, the power available in the sure. in the output so in my case that with this with this uh 1500 that was 1450 so as long as i contacted svs and or whomever your amplifier uh your subwoofer manufacturer is and said how what is the maximum power this mm-hmm. thing can draw at any given time and it is lower than that number yes you can plug it into um, hmm. one of these things would i i absolutely would not indeed <laughs> I would, yeah i would still plug it into the wall but uh yeah it's a really I'm so glad there's something out there that I can recommend. It yeah. comes with rack ears. It comes with a a, a sliding shelf hardware. Mm-hmm. So you can, you, you know, you have multiple options and then the, the vertical orientation. Plus you can just lie, you can just, it's got little feet. So you can lie it down on a normal shelf. So you've got all the orientations and uh, rack mounting options available to you in the box. Uh, it's, 
protects your gear perfectly from what I can tell. Uh, there's no chance. I mean, if my projector didn't switch off mm -hmm. during the eco mode and everything, your projector is not going to switch <laughs> off. Okay, because this thing has been the most finicky projector I've ever had. So I am perfectly ha uh, happy to recommend this to Great. people. So uh, check it out well, on AV Gadgets. We'll have the link in the show notes. And uh, what did you watch this week, Rob? All right. Uh, I, I watched very, very little. <laughs> that wasn't the priority at all. So I'll just say I watched the uh, IIHF World Junior Hockey Championships. Oh. Um, you know, most of the players in there, regardless of the country they're playing for, are uh, drafted players. So this is like seeing the, the new up and coming uh, prospects. And congratulations to Canada having won the gold medal uh, over the uh, Finnish team. A very, very close uh, game in the gold medal game. So that was very entertaining. And that's about it. How about Tom? Oh, I lost. I watched lots of stuff this week. <laughs> well, let's not belabor it. We do have lots of questions, amazingly. Uh, so I finished Sandman, including the extra episode they put out randomly. There was, like, yeah, there was a. Who a, does that? I, I like, think who? It, how did we, did we just have extra stuff lying around, and somebody went, "Well, you know, we could cut a new episode." That right. so weird. I uh, think Netflix loved it. was like, "We released it all, but then we we kind of want to dip our toe into the week to week thing, so we'll release one bonus episode a week later and see how that goes." I had no idea. <laughs> I I read about it and I was like, I watched all the episodes, mm -hmm. and then I I went I was on Netflix yesterday and or the day before, and I was like, it does say a new episode. Yeah singular yeah. that's weird so but, i clicked on it and yes sure enough there wasn't it was like a two-parter episode two two episodes huh. in one, epi in one right. episode anyways loved it uh right. absolutely uh so this the guy who plays sandman is so weird looking <laughs> <laughs> and i don't mean that in, a, in any sort of negative way whatsoever because it fits the character so well like mm -hmm. he looks otherworldly and he's supposed to be very goth looking and light you know very kind of pale and and everything and and it it i read the comic 30 plus years ago mm -hmm. so i have not touched that comic in over 30 years and i'm as i'm watching i'm going oh yeah i remember they really followed the comic very very okay. closely um and it's funny because i forgot about desire so desire is one of the endless and mm -hmm. uh who kind of shows up more towards the end there and i just think the actor they had playing uh desire was perfect because in the comic if i remember correctly because desire doesn't uh takes all kind of different forms like people okay. desire all sorts of different things mm -hmm. uh like the character like from panel to panel will change mm. like what they look like what mm. gender they are all these other stuff so the actor that played uh desire i thought was just amazing uh they were uh they kind of reminded me of my, my middle son my middle son has a <laughs> perpetual scowl, scowl on his face okay. except when he smiles then suddenly like his like he his his face just absolutely transforms into <laughs> something else like something that looks like beyond happy so it, it's this actor had the, the same sort of like when they looked mad you were like a little and then when they smiled you're like oh uh -huh. <laughs> it's like it, it, like a completely different person highly expressive times. so i was really uh i'm really looking forward to season two which they have not confirmed yet but i can't believe they won't uh it was i was quite impressed with that great uh watched lost city on uh, which is a Sandra Bullock, Ch uh, Chatham Taylor, no, Channing Tatum, that's it, and uh, Brad Pitt was in it as well, cut along with some other people. Uh, my wife described it perfectly. She goes, "It was fun, but I'm never going to remember this movie." Ah. <laughs> like, All right. completely unmemorable. Uh, Sandra Bullock was great. I think she was underutilized. Her ability for physical comedy was mm -hmm. like hinted at, but not like. Ex not like uh, you know explored or mm. uh really utilized as well uh as i thought it could be but it was fine it was fine <laughs> and lastly i watched all the rest of resident evil i powered through that piece of crap um the so the resident series e version the you're series. Talking about. okay though that that also, I think most of the movies kind of fall within that same sort of description. But uh, yeah, the first couple of episodes I was kind of liking. I was kind of liking where it was going. And by the end, yeah, I was mentioned. like, oh, I, was, I just was like, okay, guys, like, <laughs> I understand that there needs to be fan service in here. I understand that. But can we just pick something and stick with it for five mm. minutes? And, you know, these twists stop being t like when you're getting whiplash from all the twists 
and stuff, <laughs> it, it, you you stop being surprised. You start being annoyed. Right. So by the end of it, I was just like, okay, just 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 stop. All this is dumb. Uh, the the backstabbing, the twists and turns, and uh, they had one whole episode that was like, we have to do play homage to like the stupid puzzles that are in Resident Evil. Oh jeez. Okay. So yes. there was like the a that there make was no like, sense in real life. They're fine. Yeah. The video they game, tried but... to. They try to explain. They're like, "Oh, okay. Dad's leaving us clues that only we would uh-huh. understand." And I'm like, "Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh." Okay. Dumb. And then uh-huh. they like forgot about it for three episodes, and then came Perfect. back to it. I'm like, oh, sh-. "So, not great." <laughs> okay. And I thought actually somehow, and I don't know if it's because I was less invested in the characters or whatever, but I thought that acting got worse as we went on as mm. well. But I think that's not necessarily the fault of the actor as much as it is at some point you're like, I have to say what? And they're just like, all right, I'll or try maybe, to sell it, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm like, you and I are on the and same. schedules got tighter as they went along. <laughs> you know, and then they had like the big CGI set piece at the end there. Uh-huh. And I'm like, you know, there was like drones that seemed to have infinite. And I'm, I'm like, they're itty bitty drones and they just won't stop firing bullets. Mm. Like, where are they coming from? Mm-hmm. Like, give them lasers. Because sure. at least lasers, maybe there's a big power source I don't quite understand, like a fusion <laughs> reactor in there or something that I don't quite understand. But I do understand that that little drone does not have 700,000 pieces of ammunition. For sure. You know, but whatever. It, if you've started watching it and you're like, I don't know if this, maybe they'll get better. The answer is it does not. Gotcha. It, it does not get better. It only gets it only gets worse. All right. Anything yes. else we have to talk about before this podcast begins? I don't think so. I think we can get into it and uh, play a little catch up here. All right. So AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions to get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Go to the website for our show notes and our Flickr albums, which you will probably want to go to this week unless mm-hmm. you want to watch a floating thing up on YouTube. <laughs> um Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, YouTube.com slash AV Rant. Contact Rob directly, Rob at AV Rant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect, Tom at AV Rant.com. My Twitter is at AV Rant underscore Tom. We should give out your address so people can send you paper towels. <laughs> I, I won't be doing that and doing just fine. I, in fact, uh, yeah, I got, got a bit of uh, unexpected financial support that we'll be mentioning in our listeners of the week. And just before we go on on a purely technical thing, I've made a few little clicks in the past few seconds. Have those been coming through super loud on this no, headset? That's I haven't heard them. Loud? Okay. All right. Yeah, apologies to everybody if you hear clicks and stuff. I'm on laptop. I'm on a headset, not my usual setup. And apparently <laughs> for some reason, anything on the keyboard, like it doesn't come through the microphone. It comes directly through the cable of my headset, apparently. So uh, apologies if that uh, gets in there. To you should headset. decouple your good. laptop by putting spikes yeah. underneath it. Just just put it on spikes. <laughs> this is a very, very makeshift setup. So if, if anything comes through at all, consider it a bonus for now. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank uh, Julian and Ari. They went to uh, avrant.com, clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and sent us a PayPal donation. Yeah. So thank you to Julie, Julian and Ari. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Ari. Appreciate the financial support via PayPal. So I want to thank our 139 patrons over at patreon.com. Patreon's a service. You can sign up to become a monthly subscribing supporting listener of our podcast every month they'll take some money from you and give most of it to us so thank you to all our patrons for sure that's patreon.com slash av rant podcast if you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation and a big big thank you to our 139 patrons over there if you can't uh if you can't well I, this is these this are kind is, of financial these are yeah, other ways of supporting us that aren't other ways of supporting us so gorinder <laughs> sent a movie code for rob that worked in canada finally yeah. somebody sends rob a movie code that, what was Gurinder. the movie uh, this was uh, Godzilla vs. Kong in 4K. Ah, yes. Nice. I don't mind having that at all. That was pretty good. I did watch it on uh, Crave, but that was in 1080p, so this is a better version. There we go. And James emailed Rob to say he wanted to send a small donation to put towards Rob's uh, apartment repairs. The amount he sent was certainly more than what we would consider small. So thank you, James. Yes, thank you, James. I, of course, emailed him back. We did all this uh, through email, but uh, yeah, we're going to say it on the podcast as well. Uh, Extremely generous of him, extremely unexpected, uh, not requested at all. Uh, you know, that's not why I put out the little video that was purely to explain, but uh, but he wanted to and did it of his own volition. And thank you very much. I was a bit flabbergasted. So that was uh, was really, really nice. Nice. We also got some notes of podca- uh, gratitude for keeping the podcast going uh, through the pandemic and whatever else 
atrocities are going on in the world at this moment from Jules, Mark, Michael, and Nick. And Michael says he really, really loved Prey and thought it had one of the best looking designs for the Predator uh, that he has seen. Yeah. So thank you, Jules, Mark, Michael, and Nick. I will mention uh, there were other uh, notes of gratitude that came in that on what would have been last week, I I did my best to uh, answer everybody directly via email so that nobody was left hanging. So things are uh, a bit of a mess behind the scenes. Uh, For the first time in a long time, we haven't actually answered every question that came into our email address on the podcast itself. But to try and just keep my own head straight uh, as far as what dates go where, I've just gone, okay, what would have been on the podcast? as this week that's what we're doing a couple that were left over and uh yeah there we go so that's explaining that if you didn't hear your name and you sent in a note of gratitude we very much appreciate it and i do believe i got back to you via email (laughs) okay i will agree with michael i think that prey was fantastic i I did Mm -hmm. mention it i think we talked about it two weeks ago uh i did think prey was fantastic the more i've thought about it the more i've liked it and i do agree with everybody on the internet who's saying every predator movie going forward should just Mm -hmm. be predator in you know pick time period and drop a predator in there it's like assassin's creed but with a predator (laughs) no i think i think that's i think that makes sense i I, I hate to say it but i think that's I think that's a formula I can get behind. You know, mm-hmm. no one seems to complain that every John Wick is the same John Wick. Right. You know, <laughs> you don't see anybody complaining about that. Let's just do Predators that way. Let's not try to fancy it up with, with aliens and stuff. And if we're going to fancy it up with aliens, drop them on the alien planet. Don't drop them someplace right. else where we have to have humans around. Just like plop them down <laughs> in the middle of the alien planet and just go, okay. Off we go. Off we go. So on a personal note, um, I did uh, post about my apartment situation on Twitter, put out that YouTube video. uh, Lots and lots and lots of support. A huge, huge thank you. I'm not going to run through every comment that uh, was left on YouTube because I don't know if that's people's names anyway, but I I went through and hearted them all, uh, I believe. So so you know that it's been seen by me uh, on Twitter. Uh, I I, uh, hearted everything that came through there. So again, not going to say all the names on the podcast, but I did want to mention the names that uh, specifically uh, offered uh, words of encouragement and support to me about the apartment situation uh, via email. So Kurt, Infinite Gary, Greg, Raf, Grinder, Carl, Julian, Jonathan, Terry, James, and Eric. Thank you all very much for the emails that you sent. And like I say, everybody else on Twitter and YouTube, uh, hopefully the heart on your comment lets you know that I saw it. So a big, big thank you to me. And I very, very much appreciate all the kind words. All right. Yes, guys. Thank you for supporting Rob. Yeah. Uh, in the news, Aces has fu- officially announced their r- Rogue Swift, Rog, Rog. It's Republic Swift. of Gamers, so. Whatever. Swift PG 42 UQ 42 inch OLED gaming OLED computer. Well, it's two OLEDs. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I don't know. There, was, there was an OLED in the name originally, too. I guess I didn't remove them all. Uh, in case you couldn't guess, it's an OLED. Yeah. Naturally, it's using LG's display, LG Display's 42-inch OLED panel, the OLED OLED panel. Hmm. But unlike one of the 42-inch OLED TVs, the Asus monitor includes DisplayPoint 1.4 input, in addition to two HDMI 2.1 ports, a heatsink that lets it get up to 800 nits, uh, overclocking up to 138 hertz. Uh, this is only for display port mm-hmm. and automatic standby and wake up in response to the video signal from your computer it also has a semi-matte anti-glare screen finish on the other hand while it supports hdr 10 it does not support dolby vision on the vrr side it officially supports nvidia g-sync but no mention yet of amd free sync there's also a 48 inch version again using lg's displays 48 inch oled panels the oled 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 panels. And both sizes were demoed for the press in the UK with announced prices of £1,400 for the 42 inch and £1,500 for the 48 inch. Boy, I don't see any reason to buy that 42. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you want the larger size, but a lot of people have used the 48 inch in the past because it's only been this year that the 42 inch size has become available uh, in OLED panels. And for a lot of people, putting the 48 inch on their desk is just too big. Um, is sitting, you know, two feet away. It's just too large, and they wanted the smaller size, and the 42-inch fits a little bit nicer. So this is more expensive than LG's own 42-inch C2. Uh, But, of course, the C2 is a television, so it won't do the computer monitor thing of 
turning on in response to the signal from your computer. Like you put your computer to sleep and then wake it back up the monitor. The TV isn't automatically going to wake back up. This Asus will. Uh, this Asus version also has um, aspect ratio support. Uh, where you can show an actual like 24 or 27 or 34 inch ultra wide screen. And because it's OLED, the black bars around that are just going to look completely inky black. So if you want to shrink down to the smaller screen size for a specific use case, you can do that with the Asus. That's like on a hardware level thing. Um, so kind of interesting features that it's got specifically for computers. But if you are connecting a console to it, it's full HDMI 2.1, 48 gigabits per second on two of the inputs. So you can hook up your PS5 and your Xbox Series X. And then, of course, buy a display port, hook in your gaming PC and overclock it all the way up to 138 hertz instead of only 120. So, yeah, uh, interesting features there. Uh, a couple of hundred or a couple hundred pounds uh, more expensive uh, in the UK. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to translate to US prices, but it's an interesting one if you're looking specifically for a 42-inch OLED monitor. This Asus is worth considering, I think. Plex has deployed a much-requested feature for your Plex library organization. It's called Multiple Editions. <laughs> Until now, Plex would default to showing only one instance of a given movie or TV show uh, title in your library. And then within that title, you could have multiple different versions. But now you can either follow Plex's f uh, file naming conventions described in the support article that we'll link to, or just edit the metadata of any file in your Plex library to identify it as a specific edition, such as a director's cut, special edition, 3D rather than 2D, all that crap. This will allow you to have a unique cover art for each edition and also save your place for that specific edition, excuse me, rather than all versions within a single instance of that title, which I guess it was a problem for people because I don't want to do yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, there were ways, of course, to put in multiple uh, instances of the same title. You could name it something different manually so that you could, would show up as, you know, two, two separate things when you look at all the cover art inside your Plex library. But now it's all just part and parcel of it. It recognizes, say, the director's cut, the special edition, the theatrical version, recognizes those things. Uh, if you name the files according to their convention, it makes it that much easier, but you can just manually go back into your existing titles and re-edit the uh, metadata that's attached to it. So it's just a way to, uh, you know, better personalize and better organize your uh, Plex library. So a nice feature add there. All right. Movie Pass is supposedly coming back to life on Labor Day. They will open a wait list for five days starting at, didn't they screw a bunch of people? <laughs> I'm trying to remember oh, what happened with I Movie mean, Pass. They, they got uh, passed around to three different owners in total and, uh, yeah, declared bankruptcy at one point and yeah, there, there was a lot of unhappiness with uh, MoviePass, and what, what, what's being announced uh, gi gives me substantial amount of pause. Okay. So anyways, they will open a wait list for five days starting at 9 a.m. Eastern on Thursday, which is day yesterday. For this, oh, no, today for this podcast. If you're listening to the audio only, yeah, you might be seeing it on, uh, on, uh, it should on be YouTube, Thursday. although probably a few, uh, a few hours after this, because I'm not going to post it at 9 a.m. Eastern time on Thursday, but... Yeah. Yeah. If you're seeing this on YouTube as it comes out uh, in this wonderful version where you're not actually seeing any video, uh, <laughs> it's already been open for a few hours. Uh, get on it if you really, really want to. But we're going to warn you that you might want to might want to double check. So it's going to start at 9, 8, 9 a.m. Eastern on Thursday, closing at midnight. Mm -hmm. uh, well, like 11.59 on Monday mm -hmm. p.m. Eastern, yeah. whatever. If you're selected to be on the wait list... So I guess there's a lottery. You'll get 10 invitations that you can send to friends, but why would you do that? But the new beta service won't open across the U.S. all at once. Instead, they'll, uh, they say they'll weigh the level of engagement from people on the wait list in each market and roll out the service accordingly. Wow. Uh -huh. So we have enough for everybody on the wait list to get on the wait list. But Seems instead... Like what we're going to do is try to multi-level marketing you guys into yep. getting 10 of your friends. And if mm -hmm. you don't get enough friends, then we're not going to open first in your market. Is yep. that what I'm reading here? That That is very much what I am inferring uh, from what has, <laughs> been, uh, what has been announced. Also, uh, on a grammatical note, it just annoyed me to no end because they insisted on never using the word invitation and only use the word invite. Uh, which I, I get it colloquially, invite has become a noun, but it's, it's not a noun. Invite is a verb. Invitation is the noun, and it's really not that hard to use invitation in this place. But uh, anyway, that, that just annoyed me on a grammar level. Grammar Rob reared his head once again. There we go. 
<laughs> so if this already sorry if this is already sounding shady, which it is, just remember <laughs> that founder Stacy Spikes, who's, that's can't be their real name, who regained control of Movie Pass last November announced earlier this year that the new MoviePass beta would be all about Web3 credits that you could transfer on a blockchain. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's some buzzwords. And that mm-hmm. you could potentially earn more credits by allowing eye tracking on your phone to monitor you and make sure you actually watch the ads that will give you more credits. Oh, my God. Thank uh-huh. you, Black Mirror. Uh, <laughs> there's no more all-you-can-eat plan. Instead, there will be a $10, $20, and $30 tiers that give you an unspecified number of credits. You'll get a physical card you can supposedly use at any theater that accepts credit cards. But then they also say they've made partnerships with about 25% of the theaters in the United States. In the event, signing up on, on the wait list uh, will be free. Yeah. Except for... Selling all your data. Because that's... <laughs> There's no way they're not selling all your data. <laughs> Believe me, this is this 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 is a you just you just might as well just sell your soul because that's kind of. I seems mean, legally like cover my behind. I don't know for a fact that they will sell your data. That I, but that, that's a, a, a unfounded allegation. So let's not say they're actually going to do it. But also, just look at what they're saying. So <laughs> it raises some red flags in some my red flags. view. The entire thing's a red flag. It seems to All be. right. Uh, let's see here. Well, let's get to some of these questions, I suppose. We should mm-hmm. on this podcast that answers your home theater Navy questions. Julian in England. Julian followed uh, some of our previous advice and got a pair of Kef LS50 speakers for his desktop computer setup. He also got the Kef KC62 Unicore subwoofer with this dual opposed uh, woofers. He's running this 2.1 setup from a NAD M33 stereo receiver with DRAC. He also has a third LS50 on hand that he could deploy as a center. He's now semi-retired, so he's got a bit more time to enjoy movies and games. He'd like to continue using his home office setup for those purposes, so he'd like to expand to a surround sound system or preferably Atmos. His home office is only 8 by 10 <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so it's not a lot. But it has an opening with no door in the rear right corner... T- uh, into the den. So the, the office goes into a den, which supposedly probably goes into something else. He briefly thought that he might try adding a Denon home soundbar plus the Denon home subwoofer and home 150 wireless speakers to surrounds, but then he thought better of it and decided that a Marantz Slimline NR1711 receiver and adding a pair of Kef Q150 surrounds probably makes the most sense. Did he already do this? No, but that's the plan as, as of the last email that I had with him. Okay, so he's yeah. got some plans here. We've got some pictures. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got three, it looks like three monitors. Uh, he's got no problems getting the 48-inch OLED OLED on his desk. Well, that's that's going to be coming up, so yeah. So um, I'm opening up. There we go. Opening <laughs> Lots a, of liquid for Tom once again. I rode almost 30 miles this morning, maybe a little oh, bit more wow, than 30 congrats. miles. So whatever. Nicely done. Yeah. Uh, so he's got his speakers raised up over the top of his monitors, kind of mm-hmm. angled down slightly. Uh, I like that they're angled down slightly and not like pointed directly at his face. Right, right. <laughs> this will still work absolutely fine in this setup. It is one seat. It is a computer desk. Yes, there it is a computer are not desk. A whole audience to worry about. Yeah, and it looks like he's got uh, a shelving unit directly behind him mm-hmm. and a cat scratching pole or something. I don't know what that thing is. <laughs> something rolled up. Um, Might be a lamp. Maybe could mm-hmm. be. Uh, my point being is that he doesn't. He he really doesn't have much room behind him. It looks like he's actually got his desk set up on the long wall. Would be my guess. Yes. The ten yeah. foot wall. Yeah. And then so that it's only eight feet from front to back, and he's got a desk, so probably just enough room to really roll that chair back and not run directly into the shelf. That's about it. it. Shelby unit behind him. Anyways, he has painstakingly dialed in Drac on his NAD M33 integrated amp, so he would like to continue using that when he just wants 2.1 stereo audio. Then when it's time for surround sound, he wanted to double check. He could connect the spare LS50 as a center and add a pair of Q150 surrounds to the Marantz and then use the Marantz preouts to feed his NAD, which would still power his front left and right uh, pair of LS50s, right? Yeah, that's true. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I mean, I, to, yeah, this, this I, is a I mean, classic I, thing. This is a humongous waste of resources. Like, the, the NADs, there's nothing about that NADs that's going to make those speakers sound any better, uh, other than the, the Dirac, I guess. You yeah, I make, mean, the issue is that he spent all this time and effort 
dialing in his 2.1 setup so he doesn't want to dismantle that which i can appreciate because he's like look too. i've got this exactly the way i want it for my two channel sources i'm happy it's just when i watch a movie on this setup i'd now like to have surround sound so i get a surround sound receiver that has front left and right pre-outs which the Morant slim lines do they only yes. have pre-outs for the front left and right but that's all he needs <laughs> so feed that into the back of his existing mad uh integrated amp and it does have you know just a pair of rca uh stereo inputs there so that way it doesn't have to disconnect things on the stereo side and can just continue using those as front left right so yeah that will work uh functionally um however uh i don't know how you're gonna make i I guess you can do uh i don't know what level of odyssey uh, it's just uh, regular multi-eq on the uh, on the slim line there are odyssey versions where you can have it eq everything but your front left and rights oh the front left right bypass yeah which means that you could then use drac just on your front left and rights well i was more (laughs) thinking that like you know when he's switching over to movie watching and going to his surround sound setup that i would now treat that nad integrated amp just as an amplifier so I would just put it into direct mode, whatever NAD's version of direct mode is, because I don't want the NAD applying bass management, right? All the right. bass management's already going to be done in the Marantz. You're going to pick a volume level on the NAD that you're always going to set the NAD integrated amp to the same volume level when it's surround sound time. So that now that NAD integrated amp is just acting as a dumb stereo amplifier. It's you're going to put it in a you know direct mode or straight mode or whatever they call it that turns off direct, turns off bass management, and just plays the stereo signal exactly as it is. And we're going to let the Marantz act as your surround sound processor. I think you'll be fine with that because the subwoofer tuning and everything's going to be happening in the Marantz and Odyssey is going to be run. And he's not as critical about the surround sound experience as the stereo experience. So I think that's the solution here. So just a, a couple of things to be aware of and careful of when you're going to surround sound mode, make sure you put your NAD into direct mode and choose an, uh, a level on the master volume that you're always going to set it to. And then it just becomes a dumb stereo amplifier at that point. But otherwise, functionally, that'll work. It will work. I yeah. think, again, uh, you have put a lot of, I, 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 think, I think, I feel like this is like a uh, sunk cost fallacy going on here. It's like, I've already got this thing. Some time. <laughs> yeah. But in this, the cost in this case being time, I've yeah. already sunk all this time into getting this right. I don't want yeah. to have to read. Yeah, I think you just get rid of the NAD and just do you could, everything through because the, functionally the everything through the Marantz will be simpler and it will work. And you can use the Odyssey Editor app and dial yeah. it in similarly, not exactly the same. Of course, the process is a little different, uh, but you could dial it in similarly to how you dialed into Rack. So, but. You know that will be a uh, an additional amount of time that you'd have to dedicate to doing that. So I understand. Yes. Yeah. And if you think that uh, doing that additional amount of time at the very beginning, once and getting it done, is worth more than having right. to go through every time that you want yeah. to watch surround versus stereo and, and make, keep check the additional the equipment your, in the room. <laughs> yeah, and check the levels of the NAD, and and, yeah. and then halfway through a movie, you go, man, I don't know if I've got the levels right, and have to stop mm-hmm. the movie and go mm-hmm. look at it again and make sure you've got the levels right. And then you're like, I'm not really sure. Yeah, the, to me, this is a no brainer. Get rid of the NAD, sell it, help, help, let it pay for some of your other stuff. That is uh, what I would do too. Yeah. That there's there's a there's no world in which I don't make that recommendation, and I feel your hesitancy. Mm-hmm. I would I would direct you towards Andrew over at uh, AV Gadgets. Mm-hmm. I think that you should uh, reach out to him and ask him how he felt about some of the things I told him when he started working uh, <laughs> for me, and how resistant he was, and then how he has now sold all of that gear. Yeah, he <laughs> <laughs> he's like like. You don't. You guys don't even know. He keeps slipping, <laughs> slipping down the the audio file slope, and then I pull him back, and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, and I'll, I'll, just simply by asking him questions. So I'm going to ask you some questions uh, that I think you need to answer at the v- very beginning here. I think you should do what you're planning on doing okay. and listen, listen a little bit, and then I want you to just run like uh, unhook the speaker wire yeah hook it into the 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 Marantz, mm-hmm. run odyssey fully yeah and then listen again and tell me that you 
hear a significant difference sure. there. And I'm talking about run the Odyssey fully and then listen to a stereo source and then, li- yeah. you know, back and forth here. I really, really don't feel like it's going to be <laughs> worth keeping that NAT around. Question two or B or whatever we're talking about here on his. Uh, his CAF Unicore sub has left right uh, RCA inputs. Any reason he couldn't fill, feed one input from the NAD and one input from the Marantz? That way his subwoofer could be active whether he was using the Marantz for the surround sound or only using his NAD for 2.1 stereo. Uh, again, this should it work? I, I don't see any reason why it won't. I don't see anything... Yeah, that should be okay. But once again, just making sure that when the NAD is being deployed strictly as an amplifier for the front left, right, when you're in surround sound mode, that you're using a listening mode that turns the bass management off. So you don't want, you know, duplicate and potentially slightly out of phase subwoofer information (laughs) coming into the left and right inputs independently. You'd want just the subwoofer signal from the Marantz when it's surround sound time. Uh, But physically, there's no reason that this shouldn't be able to work. Again, I'm... I want you to think about what is the cost of mm-hmm. aggravation to you of keeping the NAD into the system just so that you can go, why does my subwoofer sound weird? And then realizing that you forgot to right. switch everything over the way that you were supposed to. Or when you go back to 2.1 saying, how come my subwoofer's not work? Uh, there 2. could be 0. that too. <laughs> how come my subwoofer's not working? How come everything sounds weird and realizing you've left it in direct mode? And yes. now, you know, it's to me, this is... It's such a no-brainer. But anyways, when he's playing surround sound, would he still leave Dirac on on the NAD? He intends to run Odyssey either way. Well, Rob has already explained this. You'll put it in direct mode, which will disable it, yeah. and it'll just be as a... So yes, you would leave it on in that you wouldn't have to... Uh, oh, like go into the menu system and turn anything. it off. Yeah, sure. yeah. But you would just put it into direct. But again, if everything sounds weird, <laughs> it's because you forgot to do something when you're doing all these changing things over. He asked, would he need to add Atmos speakers right away, or could he somehow listen to Atmos soundtracks with just 5.1 speakers at first? Uh, I I wrote an article about this on AV Gadgets. I'll try to remember to link it up here. Just to, rem- to, to, to remind people, Atmos is not its own surround sound format. Okay, Atmos is metadata laid on on top of something right. else. In this yeah, case, there's like a bed layer of traditional 5.1 or 7.1 audio, and then there is metadata on that that, if you have an Atmos decoder, extracts information from that bed layer and puts it into the overhead speakers instead. Right. So when, yeah. So you are you're going to get 5.1 or 7.1 with efforts on the disc or on the streaming service. It's going to come in, and if you don't have any Atmos speakers, the metadata is basically just ignored. But all the sounds are still there. Mm-hmm. Okay, all the sounds are are still there. That's the thing to remember. Uh, you're not you're not missing anything. In fact, it doesn't really matter how as long as you have stereo speakers. It doesn't really matter how many speakers you have. No sounds are ever deleted. Like Indeed. AV manufacturers are yeah, very we'll careful. Mixed down into whatever you have. <laughs> So they're like, what about this? What about that? No, it never, they never <laughs> delete anything because they, they know f- it, uh, mm-hmm. for sure that they, that if they delete sounds, you will be mad. <laughs> like, yes. Like, like people will stop buying their receivers if they, if somebody can prove, oh, this sound disappeared when I, when I went to 2.1 or whatever mm-hmm. it was, uh, so don't ever worry about that. There's always those sounds always go. So can you hear them? No. You know, <laughs> if you're running those kefs in full range and stereo and you put a 5.1 movie or 7.1 movie through it, all the sounds will go to those two speakers. Sure. Will you be able to hear the low bass? Absolutely not. It will not be available because those speakers cannot reproduce it. But it went there. <laughs> that's, not, <laughs> More, that's, not the, that's not the receiver's fault. <laughs> More than that, though, on the uh, Marantz NR1711 slimline receiver, it does have Dolby's height virtualization. Right. Uh, so if you have a 5.1 setup and then you put an Atmos track into there, if you have Dolby uh, Atmos height virtualization active, the front panel will still say Atmos. So you you will know that you really are hearing the Atmos soundtrack. And of course, as the name implies, the height virtualization, 
The speakers are not physically present, but it is attempting to create the illusion that you have overhead speakers through some manipulation of phase and things like that coming out of your existing speakers. So there is Dolby Atmos height versus virtualization that's built right in there. You'll see Atmos on the front panel, and it has DTS Virtual X, which is the same idea for DTS X soundtracks. It'll play through your physical 5.1 speakers, but will virtualize a pair of overhead speakers. Uh, I will mention on AV receivers that top out at seven speakers maximum, like that Morant Slim line, uh, it will only be virtualizing a pair of top fronts. It will not be trying to virtualize four overhead speakers. It does not have processing for four overhead speakers. It maxes out at a 5.1.2 configuration with top fronts as the default. So that's what it'll be virtualizing, but you can get a little taste of it. You can see Atmos, you can see DTS X on the front panel to confirm that you're listening to the correct signal. And uh, yeah, you don't have to physically put speakers up there right away. Okay. On to monitors. <laughs> You'd also like to get a new monitor that supports 4K 120 HDMI 2.1. I, I wonder if there's a new monitor that was just released. Mm -hmm. In the, in the UK. However, he's got he's got caveats. In addition to his computer, he's also got an Xbox Series X, so he'd like all the latest console gaming support, as well as being a great computer monitor. He'd retain his multi-monitor setup, to, uh, so something like a 32-inch size. 32-inch size would be ideal. Any suggestions? How do you feel about 42 inches? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, of course it was my first thought. And I mean, my first thought is to just go ahead and get an LG C2 OLED because it's the least expensive. Uh, 1,100 pounds it was listed for in the UK. And uh, in fact, it was down to 1,000 pounds uh, when it was on sale. So my first thought was a 42 inch OLED if you need it to act more like a monitor than a television. That Asus has just been announced. We know it's coming in the UK. That's where they did the announcement. Uh, that'll be for 1,400 pounds, so a little bit more expensive. Uh, but he was pretty adamant that he wanted to stick with the 32-inch size. Mm. Um, so honestly, uh, the one that I'm going to suggest here is it, it's, it's not out yet. <laughs> uh, it's, it's still on its way. Uh, but there is an Acer Predator uh, monitor that is um, uh, scheduled to be coming out at some time this year. Uh, so, yeah, let me just see here. I, I sort of messed up in my uh, notes here a little bit here, which one it was. Ah, I'm forgetting the name of it offhand. I'll have to look that up as we go. Um, just to mention on some of the other 32-inch monitors that are out there, Samsung uh, does have their um, Odyssey uh, I believe it's the G7, which is a little bit less expensive, the 1150 pound uh, one. That is curved, which I'm not a huge fan of, uh, but that is one of the few options to get a VA LCD type panel rather than IPS. So if you want the higher native contrast, uh, that is an option uh, that's, that's available, but I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, so yeah, I found uh, the name, the uh, Acer Predator X32FP. Uh, that sort of looks like in the 32 inch size, it's got all the features that he was really looking for. It goes all the way up to um, display HDR 1000 certification. So it, it can actually hit the 1000 nits. It's got full uh, DCI P3 and Adobe RGB color support. So you have the genuine white color has actual HDMI 2.1 ports. So that's that console gaming support, 4K 120, of course. So. Yeah, that that uh, that Acer Predator X thirty two FP is is honestly the one that I would probably point to, uh, but not out yet. So a few of these ones are are ones that we might uh, wait for a little bit. Asus does have their Pro Art displays, but they're really expensive. I I couldn't even find uh, the one that has HDMI two point one, which is the PA thirty two UCG. Just yeah, so memorable because they have other ones that are almost exactly the same but slightly different uh, letters on there, but. It's, uh, I couldn't find the price in the UK, but it's 4,700 US dollars. So when he's saying he wants to keep the price somewhat reasonable, I don't think that really counts. Uh, Gigabyte does have an option that is not 4K resolution. Uh, it's 1440p resolution, and it's only display HDR 400, which means it'll take an HDR signal, but not really show it to you. It's just compatible with it. Uh, so that's the AORUS FI32U. It's under a thousand pounds, so if you need to, it's one that would be like compatible with everything, uh, but it wouldn't really be my top choice there. So I think if you're sticking with the 32 inch, I'd wait for that Acer Predator. Um, otherwise, honestly, a 42 inch OLED is my top choice, but if it's just too big, then that Acer Predator. All right. Uh, oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff there. I didn't realize I hadn't scrolled past everything. <laughs> Dane. 
Dana appreciated our advice regarding Denon's receiver lineup. I don't remember what we said, but I'm sure it was brilliant. We saved him some money. See? Brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, his room is roughly 5,000 cubic feet in total, and he was using a single SVS at PB3000 subwoofer that's positioned to the right of his couch. Well, at least they'll shake the couch. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is like an oddly shaped basement, I'm guessing? Yeah. It looks, it looks like a basement. It has all sorts of different cut-ins and jut-outs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Anyways. He wants the gradually rising base response that is widely recommended online. So he went into the Odyssey Editor app and drew himself a target curve for a subwoofer output, which is like up uh, plus 12, 12. Yeah, 12 plus 12 at 20 DB. hertz there. Jesus. <laughs> and when the subwoofer started farting, he didn't know why. After <laughs> saving and loading, he measured with Room EQ Wizard at his primary seat with Odyssey Dynamic EQ turned off. There was no indication of a rise in base with the Dynamic EQ turned on. There was definitely a rise measured. Probably because he wasn't at reference level. When he, yes. Yeah. When he, when he measured. I mean, hey, at least we know dynamic EQ is doing its job. So that isn't the way it's supposed to work, is it? Uh, yeah, it's exactly the way it's supposed to well, work. Well, dynamic EQ is supposed to work exactly that way. Yes, but uh, but uh, with dynamic EQ off, why is it still more or less a flat line down to twenty hertz? Right. The gradual rise in the bass ought to be there, and measurable even with dynamic EQ turned off. Right. Any idea why that isn't working? Uh, let me look at this. Yeah, so I mean, this this is going to be a little bit pedantic, uh, but I think it's worthwhile because many people very understandably uh, do some of the things that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, so first of all, um, there is no way to retroactively go into the Odyssey Editor app and make a change to the initial run. So if you ran Odyssey either directly on the AV receiver or even if you ran Odyssey through the Odyssey Editor app, you cannot go back into the app and change the target curve after the fact without running the entire thing again. So if you were thinking that, oh, I made this change and I saved it and I loaded it into the AV receiver, can't it just apply my newly drawn target curve to the previous Odyssey measurement that I did during setup? No, it, it can't do that. You have to draw the target curve first, mm. run the entire Odyssey again, and now you will have that new target curve applied. So, I mean, that's, that's an easy... A error that anybody could have understandably made because other um, programs don't work like Dirac doesn't work like that. You can change Dirac after the fact and load it. It will use the measurements that it already had and then apply the new target curve. Odyssey Editor app doesn't work that way. The other thing is that anything you change in the Odyssey Editor app will only apply to the Odyssey reference or sometimes called the Odyssey movie uh, curve in right. the AV receiver. If you set it to Odyssey flat or Odyssey music or Odyssey left right bypass, those won't implement the changes that you made to the manual target curve. So you have to have Odyssey set to reference or sometimes referred to as movie, uh, depending on how the menu is labeled. So I think those are sort of the pedantic things. My guess is that maybe he made this change after having already run Odyssey, saved his changes, but maybe didn't run through all of Odyssey again, which would explain why his actual measured results don't show the rise in base when dynamic EQ is off that he had drawn uh, manually in the Odyssey editor app. So. That's sort of my best guess as to what went on there. And I mean, no blame. It's super easy to do. Oh, I have to scroll past this video. Uh, he isn't consistently measuring a, a big old dip right at 105 hertz, which you can see on the graphics mm -hmm. here. It's, he is consistently measuring that. Oh, that's, he is. That's, that's there whether dynamic EQ is on or off. There's a, there's a big old dip showing up in Room EQ Wizard at 105 hertz. He says, should he be super concerned about that? If he's sticking with a single PB... 3000 sub and it does and he doesn't really want to move it anywhere else is there anything that can be done about it the answer to that second question is yes you can move your microphone slightly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's but, that yeah <laughs> so uh okay so this dip if you're not looking at the uh the graph um is extremely it, it's extremely uh low it, it, there's a lot of change in volume but it is across a very a small q what we call it. it's it's just the width of the dip is not mm -hmm. super wide is i mean it, that does indicate that 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 probably really is a room mode that yes. probably really is a you know it's a it's a wave interaction and cancellation that happens to be because of the dimensions of your room which which are irregular of course and then the exact positioning of the sub and the seat where you took the measurement Within that room, there happens to be some 
they sound waves right at 105 hertz that are canceling themselves out right at that particular location. So uh, it, it does indicate that that really is what's going on there at room mode. And I would just say, when you've got a single sub and a single measurement position in an irregularly shaped room, and you really only have one major cancellation, uh, I think you you got pretty yeah. lucky, <laughs> to be well, honest. Well, I, I mean, so if you look at this... Gone. It's not that uh, the Q is not that wide, meaning mm -hmm. that there's it doesn't affect a ton of frequencies. And I'd much rather have a huge suck out at a very small Q yes. uh, than a huge dip. I mean, a huge a huge boost at a, at the same amount of Q. Mm. The, the reason being is it's hard to notice what you're not hearing. Sure. That much much more so than it is hard than it is hard to ignore what you are hearing. So when sure. the the frequency gets very very loud just for a second and then goes away, you're like, what was that? But when <laughs> right. it kind of disappears, it you lose it in the in everything else that's yeah. happening. This also, is the same the same thing that happens when people are like, I have tower speakers or I have bookshelf speakers and I feel like I have plenty of bass. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because you don't know what you're not hearing, and sure. here is the same sort of thing. Yeah. I. This looks much better than me to me than the alternative, and if it was a wider queue, mm -hmm. I would be much more concerned. So, I mean, I think it's okay. Think yeah. It's okay. Also, being up at 105 hertz, uh, if the majority of your speakers are crossed over at 80, you know, we're only seeing the subwoofer alone in this right. graph. At 105 hertz, we're into the crossover region. There will be contribution at 105 hertz from your speakers. The speakers themselves will still be playing at 105 hertz. And now that you'll have, you know, at least two sources of bass when you've got a speaker and the subwoofer playing. So if there's something in the front left channel, that's going to be playing out of the front left speaker and the subwoofer. A bass sound that's, you know, 90 hertz, 100 hertz, 105 hertz, right where this dip is. Uh, the speaker is going to be contributing there. So what you would see in your measurement would be different than this. Uh, yeah. there, there might even end up being a hump just because that's what works out. Uh, but since it's higher and a very narrow queue, this is not the end of the world to me. This isn't one where I'm going to demand that you move your subwoofer or your seat around or something like that. And, and like Tom says, if you just want to feel better about it, move your microphone a little bit. And it, might, it might very well change what you see in the graph. Right. And the fact that this is only the subwoofer, which I did not realize. Mm hmm. I thought this was also the uh, the speakers with it. Uh, when you measure with the speakers, it, this could very well go completely away. Yeah. Yeah, because your speakers are making the same making bass at those same uh, at that frequency, and they're in a different location, and it's going to affect in the room differently. Uh, okay. If in the Gary, Gary asks, could a speaker manufacturer come out with a truly wireless speaker you could attach to the ceiling? No power cord, no speaker wire, RCA cable. Is anyone selling that already? Does the technology do, does the technology do still it exists? You have to take it down and plug it in to charge it. At there some is point. no there is no infinite battery, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> There's an infinite Gary with infinite questions, but there is no infinite battery. Mm -hmm. So there is no way. I mean. No solar power that can do this. There is, yes, there, it does not exist and it will never exist. I mean, not in something that you wouldn't have to recharge. Uh, there are battery powered speakers. Um, you know, the Heos One speakers that Denon uh, used to sell had an optional battery pack, but of course you would have to uh, connect the battery to charge it. Um, JBL's uh, Bar 9 sound bar has completely truly wireless surround speakers but you have to take them from the surround position and actually rather awkwardly physically plug them into the sides of the sound bar to recharge them so guess what a lot of people do either never charge them or just leave them up front all the time rather than you know occasionally bringing them from the back charging them on the sides of the sound bar and then taking them back to their surround positions so um you know the technology for battery powered speakers exists but they will have to be recharged when they're on the ceiling it would be obviously more awkward to take them down or run a cable up there to charge them but i mean that technology exists. Nobody's doing it for overhead speakers, though. I've only seen it for surround speakers. You know, those Heos 1 speakers could be used with the Heos AV receiver and act as truly wireless surround speakers. Like I mentioned with the JBL soundbar, it's got that. But it's only surround speakers. I haven't seen it for overhead. So I'd say, yeah, I mean, not exactly what you're envisioning, where you truly wouldn't need ever any wires ever. <laughs> you're going to need some kind of physical connection, at least at some point, to recharge it. And then nobody's doing it for overheads yet. 
Lastly, he asks, since Rob is going to have to replace some home theater gear, will he finally be getting a projector? In that small-ass room? <laughs> I, yeah. I, I mean, don't... look, I'm not against projectors whatsoever. I have a projector. I own a projector. It sits in my closet unused because I'm sitting six and a half feet away uh, in my in my den theater. Uh, when, when it's rebuilt, it's not going to be any bigger. I didn't change the size of my apartment or the square footage, so I'm still going to be six and a half feet away, which, you know, six and a half feet away, if I'm using a 75 or an 85 inch flat panel, that is entirely the field of view that I would want. Um, and that, that's what I'm going to stick with for now, but I'm not, a, I'm not against projectors. I'm, I'm in the scenario where a projector doesn't really make sense sitting only six and a half feet away from the screen. Yeah. You, for the price, you can get an OLED that's got yeah. much better performance. The, the <laughs> reason to get a projector over an, an OLED is size. Size. And he doesn't need size <laughs> and he doesn't have to <laughs> sacrifice contrast for it which is what you do with a projector. You sacrifice contrast for the size. Yeah, or have to watch in, you know, truly pitch blackness to get the very best black levels and contrast out of it. Yeah. yeah. No, he's not doing that. I wouldn't do it either. If I were <laughs> Carl, when ProjectorScreen.com and Projector Central held their joint ultra-short throw projector shootout, some of the models scored a 10 for black level and contrast. Carl and his wife, E., uh, want the best overall performance for their forthcoming Vanta Black that you don't want a projector. Vanta Black. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they want the size, so they, they want the best that a projector can do. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not going to be an ultra short throw. Yeah, let's say, just in case you're wondering. So yeah. they, should they be considered one of these ultra short throw models over their current front runner, the JVC NZ8? And the answer, of course, is no. Absolutely um, not, no. I don't... So... I don't know. I, I, I would consider an ultra short throw in my theater. Sure. Uh, I, I see, you know, it would make th my life easier not to have mm -hmm. to run because I'm going to have to run another the, another cable and I can't pull the one out of the wall that I've currently got in the wall. So that's just not going to happen. Uh -huh. So I've got, uh, uh, you know, it, it's ultra short throws almost certainly if I get another projector will be it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm probably going to do the same thing as Rob and just going to, OLED if this yeah, I mean, like ever in Tom's totally case, going from a 92-inch projection screen that's on the wall to an 85-inch flat panel that's on a stand, maybe a foot or foot and a half in front of the wall. Again, the field of view is retained right. if Tom does that, so that that yeah. could be could be the way Tom goes. Yeah, uh, in your case, uh, yeah, I, I would think the JVC. There's no ultra short throw projector that I can think of that can compete with the black levels. Of not the even ABCs. close. Not so. even, it's, it's not even the same ballpark. Uh, just to explain how the, in that particular shootout that Projector Screen and Projector Central uh, did jointly together, uh, what they did is they had um, everything scored uh, comparatively, right? Yes. So they were comparing six, uh, you know, particular models all at once, because I think they did it in a group of six and a group of eight. Um, so when they compared them together, whichever one scored the highest was just given a 10. That's the 10, right? right. And then everything else was ranked below that one in that particular category by a commensurate amount because they were trying to weight all the scores to give sort of like an overall at the end. So scoring a 10 in black level and contrast, that just meant it was the best of the group. It doesn't mean it's a 10 compared to any projector that exists. And had the NZ8 been in there, um, you know, and they had had the, the proper environment, truly blacked out room and everything like that. I mean, the NZ8 would have scored the 10 in the black level in contrast for sure. And all of these ultra short throws would have been scoring like a five or lower. That's that's sort of the scale that you would have ended up at. So absolutely not in your case with your Vanta Black Theater. You need to get a JVC and there's really no question about it. Yeah. Uh, getting genuine Dolby Vision in a home projector still seems a bit iffy but some people described how adding a mad vr or lumigen video processor to a projector can give you a dolby vision quality hdr experience no home projector is actually doing 4000 nits though right <laughs> not home i mean mm -hmm. you can put one in your home that will do it mm -hmm. <laughs> but with it's... a small enough screen size yeah. and enough lumens yeah, it could that could be but yeah it wouldn't it wouldn't look like a flat panel <laughs> so what's our take on this phrase of a dolby vision quality image it's called marketing garbage or people trying to convince themselves that they didn't waste their money when they really shouldn't I mean, whatever dude yeah don't, i mean i just I don't kinda, buy into it i kind of get it as a shorthand it's it's not technically accurate of course um, there are some projectors now that have a dolby vision mode and they some i mean they're they're all from chinese manufacturers that claim they really have dolby vision approval i don't 
I don't None believe that. Do. Yeah, <laughs> I'll no, just no. say I don't believe that they actually have Dolby approval uh, for the Dolby Vision mode uh, that they put on that projector. But when somebody uses a phrase like Dolby Vision quality without it actually being Dolby Vision, I mean, what what I think anybody using that type of phrase is driving at is the idea behind Dolby Vision is that if you have a display that cannot actually show you the nits one for one, that the mastering monitor that was used to make the content would have shown them. So our TVs at home, they're not showing us 4,000 nits. They're showing us, you know, 1,500, maybe 2,000 if it's an LCD, under 1,000 if it's an OLED. Uh, but what they do, of course, is tone map. And you've got, you know, dynamic tone mapping, frame by frame dynamic tone mapping, but you also have proper dynamic metadata like Dolby Vision. So the idea is that if that's all baked into the signal like it is in Dolby Vision and you have a Dolby Vision compatible display, you should be able to see all the highlight detail. It'll have to be tone mapped. It won't be one for one. This is exactly the number of nits that the mastering monitor display, but the idea is that you're not gonna clip off a bunch of detail and it's all just gonna turn into uniform white when you should have been able to see some details in. Uh, you know, Ben Affleck's shirt in Batman vs. Superman that was mastered to 4,000 nits. You should be able to see a few little wrinkles in the white shirt when, you know, the flash reaches out to him in his vision, but most displays, it just turns into a uniform blank white. Mm. Um, so, you know, Dolby Vision, if it's all implemented correctly, can retain that. So if they're saying, okay, you hook up a Mad VR NV or a Lumigen video processor with its frame-by-frame -frame dynamic tone mapping, where it's ignoring the metadata and just analyzing the signal itself, and you connect that to something like a JVC that has really excellent contrast capabilities, that it retains all that highlight detail like a proper, proper Dolby Vision display could have done, and saying, okay, so I'm getting something akin to a Dolby Vision quality type of experience. It's really just referring to I was still able to see all the highlight detail that I was supposed to see, hopefully the shadow detail too, hopefully at the correct levels, because to me, the, the thing with the Mad VR and the Lumigen is in the shadow detail, I think they're actually showing too much. I think people like it because they're like, look at this detail I wasn't seeing before. It's like, that was supposed to be below black. <laughs> I've, I've seen some of the comparison images where it's like, on the mastering monitor, that was below black. And now the Lumigen of the Mad VR has brought it into visibility. They brought below black information into visibility to show you more shadow detail. You can manually tune that though on, mm. on both of those video processes. So it's not as though they're you know, automatically gonna be uh, inaccurate. So that's where I would say I'm okay with the, the intention behind using that phrase. Obviously what I just said took way longer than three words of saying Dolby Vision quality. Um, so it's a shorthand to indicate the detail is all being retained. I'm okay with that. Obviously, it's not technically correct. Mm. Dennis. Dennis is using a Marantz SR6014. He ran Odyssey Auto Setup, which set the trim levels for all of his speakers. If he wants, he can go into the settings menu, go to the speakers, and then manually set, uh, set and then manual set up to change the levels, and that would affect his trim levels no matter which source he is using, correct? The answer to that is That yes. is correct. That would be global across everything that comes into that AV receiver. But then he tried pressing the option button on his remote while playing uh, something was playing. He had a section for channel level adjust. He checked the values in there, and they were all different from the trim levels that had been set by the auto setup. Are those overriding Odyssey? Should he be adjusting them? Which values are correct? It is very confusing. Um, I don't yeah, I don't that. blame you. It is confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah, the, uh, in the manual there, it actually has the phrase in the little footnotes, which are even smaller print than, <laughs> other, than the rest of the font there. But it does say specifically channel level adjust settings are stored for each input source. So this is not a global setting. Uh, if you go into the option menu and alter the channel level adjust of whatever given channel, maybe your center, maybe your subwoofer, those are the most common ones that people change, it will only affect that one active source. When you switch to another different source, it won't affect that, that different HDMI input on the AV receiver. Of course, it does say it stores it. So if you forget to put it back to the default values in the option channel level adjust, the next time you come back to that source, it's still going to have that adjustment being applied. I'm not a tremendous fan of doing it. I see the sort of convenience behind it. If you just need to temporarily right. boost your center speaker or cut down your subwoofer, that's sort of why they have it there. I almost wish it didn't store it. 
I wish it were like a uh, one time it every single time every time it turns off it it's a it's a uh, I sort of wish it were that way it does not override Odyssey Odyssey is still in effect you are only boosting or cutting the overall so is the level default what what Odyssey set the trim levels at or is it no it's just zero, zero. The, yeah. the default is just g- zero in the channel level adjust. So you're and adjusting it, it. You're adjusting it from what your trim level was set. That's right. Plus yeah. or minus however that's many right. dB you you uh, away from zero. So if, it, right. if in the channel level, if when Odyssey said that it sent it to minus one dB, sure. because that's the right level for mm-hmm. reference level volume at your seat, and then you go and boost it up by one DB because it's the center channel, then mm-hmm. you have not, you know, you basically put, you know, you're, you're only putting it in relation to where it was set, which means you can only go down, what, 11 before it, it bottomed out anyways. Yeah. So, okay. Got where it. this could be a little bit useful, uh, where, where I don't mind that it's stored, um, there is the overall in the uh, settings menu, if you go into the inputs, where you can change the overall volume of a given source. Um, you know, so like, for example, if you use a streaming device strictly for YouTube, you could lower the volume of just that one input overall, and then that will always be at a quieter signal level than all of your other sources. You can do that in the settings input menu, but you can also do something akin to that in this channel level. Just for example, you have a particular source, uh, maybe it's your cable box, where you just always want the center channel to be louder than the other channels, um, and, and you only want it for that cable box source, you know, as an example, well, then you could do that with the channel level adjust without messing it up for your Blu-ray player and your game system and all your other sources. So I, I don't hate that it's available. It's just to be aware of. Um, it, it's the sort of thing where if you're really just trying to do it temporarily, you got to make sure you put it back. At least zero is the default, so it's not hard to yeah. remember what the default was. So if, if yeah, so if you click on it, it's like it's all zero. You're like, wait a second, you know that's not right. Where, you know, zero is where it should be. Yeah. Jules in the UK. Hey, Jules, Asus is coming out with new computer monitors. In mm-hmm. case you're wondering, they're OLED, OLED, OLED monitors. They are. Jules used uh, used to use the Windows Media Center back in the day because that's mm-hmm. that's quite some time ago. To be honest, he still misses it. And honestly, out of all the Windows things I've used, this one was probably the best. <laughs> you know? Yep, good old Windows 7, which was really quite nice to use. Came it, with Media Center for free. It was a it was a pretty good times back in Windows 7 days. I'm sure we complained about it at the time. I'm sure it was quirky, and but it was functional, and it was not a live service. So, yeah. <laughs> My wife is so mad about live services. I tell that we talk about this on the podcast. Uh, I don't think so. She is so she's finally caught on. Mm-hmm. So I have been complaining about video games and loot boxes and stuff for mm-hmm. a very very long time on this podcast as well as to my wife. And she's she finally kind of caught on when BMW started the if you want your seats to heat you have to subscribe. <laughs> yes. yes. And she's yeah. like, that's some that's what you've been talking about. I'm uh-huh. like, yes. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> And and I was like, okay, so yes, Windows Media Center, very good. Uh, but since it's truly gone at this point, he's flirted with Cody and ultimately settled, settled on using Plex running on an NVIDIA Shield. It's fine, but nothing quite like his old Media Center system. He's continued to use his Media Center remotes, but he feels it's time for a proper universal remote. Boy, you should have made that decision a couple of years ago. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> You're a couple of minutes, a couple of couple of minutes late to this game. Uh, on the home theater hardware side of things, he, there's really only his 82 inch Samsung TV, his Onkyo AV receiver, his Nvidia Shield control. But then he has a mix of different smart lights and switches, some <sighs> Philips Hue, some Zigbee, some smart things, and some con- uh, connected to Google Home. So we've talked about how the new Sofa Baton X1 and U1 could... Th- uh, I'm sorry, my friend, for which... <laughs> I'm sorry. Could that be a good solution for him? He knows we used to recommend Harmony Remotes all the time. He'd be fine with searching eBay and elsewhere. So is there a specific model of Harmony Remote that he should look for instead? Yes, because the Sofa Baton still does not work very well with these lights. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's this- really only Philips Hue that it supports at this point, and even that is still a little bit hinky sometimes with the Philips Hue. And then if you've got other ones, if you've got 
smart things and Zigbee and you're trying to integrate with Google Home and everything, I, I can't say that a Sofa Baton no. X1 is a good solution right now. If all you care about is controlling your Samsung TV, your Onkyo Wave receiver, and your NVIDIA Shield, Sofa Baton X1 can do that brilliantly. No right. problem there. And if and if you wanted to do nothing but Philips Hue, I would even say that you're okay there because they're, they're definitely working on the, the kinks that they still have to work out, and it does function with Philips Hue right now. Uh, but if you want to keep all the lighting that you've got, uh, I mean, I kind of would say that you, you want to try and find... Uh, a Harmony. They do still have like renewed Harmony remotes being sold on Amazon at inflated prices. Way inflated prices. But if it's if it's just kind of the only way to do it, I I would probably have to point you at either the Elite or the Ultimate. Yeah. Um. Th those are the ones that uh, you'd want a hub based for sure. A hub based is the only way to go when you want to control various lighting systems. But the reason I would point you at either the Elite or the Ultimate is you want to be able to put labels on there. So it means you need the screen. Um, you, there there are the couple of other options um, that don't have the touch screen. There's the companion or the smart control, but you would have to remember which button you mapped a given light command to. Uh, so, you know, try to explain that to anybody who isn't you, uh, or you'd have to, you know, uh, put a sticky note on there with, with what button does what. So, I mean, uh, the much more convenient solution is to have the touch screen option that you can actually just label and then anybody can pick it up and use it. So the elite or the ultimate are the ones you would want to look for. Um, yeah, th there are still some floating out there, so it's not impossible. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's an inflated price point at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry to say that you definitely should have picked up a Harmony when you had a chance. Yeah. I mean, you could you could get just a Harmony hub and rely on just using the app on your phone. Um, the app on your phone doesn't really let you customize how the buttons show up. All yeah. the buttons will be there. Yeah. Uh, but it, it means quite a bit of you know scrolling and, and, and flipping through pages to find what you want. So I wouldn't call it the, the most elegant solution, but yeah, it's easier that, to find just a Harmony Hub all by itself on the used market than... You know, I find when uh, when my remote dies, which mm -hmm. doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does, and I end up on the using the app, mm -hmm. I end up having to go into the devices more often yeah. than yeah. I would like to have to do with the app. And you, since you can't customize any of the screens and even the customization that you already have mm -hmm. doesn't really exist like it, it's very annoying to use the app so <laughs> i would i would go with the ultimate or the elite yeah uh kieran from uh india says uh we've he's always wondered how reference volume works when the room sizes can be so different for example Excuse me, if you set up your system in a 1500 cubic uh, foot room and you typically listen at minus 10 on the volume dial, how does it that how does it work if you take that same system and put it in a 3000 cubic <laughs> foot room? Uh, well, it, if, how far away are you sitting from the speakers? Because that's not about, yes. you know. And there might be some impact just from the additional cubic footage. But right this, in, in the base, yeah. Yeah. This is what your auto setup and your trim levels are yeah. for. Um, and if you don't have an auto setup, this is what you manually set your trim levels for. The trim levels exist to account for uh, speakers that have different sensitivities. Because uh, right. even within the same brand, if you have you know a tower, center tower, and then bookshelf surrounds or something like that, they're not all going to necessarily be exactly the same sensitivity. Uh, it's to account for what distance you're sitting from all of your given speakers and to some extent accounting for the room size as well. That is what the trim levels exist to do so that when your master volume is set to zero dB uh, to hit proper reference volume, calibrated reference volume, you will be adjusting the trim level of each and every individual speaker so that it will, when it plays the pink noise test tone, measure at proper reference volume. Uh, given the sensitivity of the speaker, your distance from the speaker, and the size of the room. So you wouldn't be able to just pick up your AV receiver and your speakers from the small room where you're sitting close, move it to a big room where you're sitting farther away, and leave the settings alone. Then you wouldn't be at reference volume anymore in the bigger room where you're sitting farther away. You would have to readjust your trim levels manually at the very least, or rerun your auto setup. And that would now adjust the trim levels. You'd have different values in the bigger room sitting farther away than you do in the small room sitting closer. You'll have different trim level values. And that's exactly what those trim levels are there for, to calibrate you to reference volume. That's right. Oh, I didn't scroll. Zach, 
Zach recently moved into a new house. He has what he considers a modest home theater audio system, a Denon S510BT AV receiver, Eclipse Reference Series uh, R12SW subwoofer, and Boston Acoustics CS23 and CS225C speakers. Anyways, I don't know what any of those <laughs> things are except for the sub. Uh, they will continue to use this system in the new living room, but he's interested in making some not too expensive upgrades. And move house. Oh, okay. He's moved into a new house. He's going to put this in his living room. His, <laughs> uh, his main concern is that they went for a very large sectional sofa. It's super comfortable, but some of the seats end up very close to the front speakers, five feet in front, and then quite far off to the uh, to either side of the center, six or seven feet off to the side. He has noticed with his current center that those particular seats definitely sound worse, including voices coming from the center speaker. So that's the first thing he'd like to upgrade. He's found deals on Clips Reference and Polk T-Series centers, but is there a particular design or brand that's especially good at wide dispersion for a scenario like this? He was also wondering if he could use two bookshelf speakers wired together and angle them slightly outwards to play the centers down. Don't do that. Don't uh, do that. That's going to make the primary seat directly in front so much worse. Yeah, um, yeah. There's no way to avoid really detrimental uh, sound wave interactions in the vocal range when you have two tweeters firing off at different angles from your yeah, center speaker sense. position. Uh, so, so definitely don't do the two bookshelf speakers, uh, you know, slightly angled outwards playing the center channel. Um, that, that is not going to be a good experience for your primary seat. Uh, I also would not recommend going for a Clips reference or a full T-series center right. speaker. You're, you're not likely at all to get an improvement in terms of the dispersion at those really off angle close up seats on the sectional sofa. So what you need is a center speaker with a design that has very wide uniform dispersion. And it tends to be the case that most of the lower priced and even some quite expensive center speakers that just have a woofer with a tweeter in the middle and another woofer on the other side, um, that is detrimental to the very wide horizontal dispersion. It's the criticism of taking a Dapolito array speaker that's meant to be vertical, uh, where the woofer above a tweeter and another woofer below limits the vertical dispersion, but it keeps wide horizontal dispersion. When you turn that speaker 90 degrees and lay it on its side, now you have tall vertical dispersion, but limited horizontal dispersion. And that's what you're running into with your current Boston Acoustics. You'd run into the same thing with a Clips reference or a full T-series center. So at the very least, you'd want to look for a center speaker that has a tweeter mid-range stack so that you, uh, the, the, where the woofers are coming in will now be at such a low frequency, they won't have to cross over into the tweeter. They'll be able to cross over into the dedicated mid-range driver. And honestly, um, like some of the least expensive options that you're going to have there are going to be SVS's prime uh, center uh, that you can get for $400 or $500 if you want the gloss finish. Uh, there's also the option of going with uh, Aperion's Novus center. Uh, that would also be one that has that type of design. Uh, but then you're getting up into a higher price point of $550 with the Aperion Novus. So that's sort of like $400 is maybe where you're starting. The other option that you could look at is um, a concentric design. Uh, so of course, when we think concentric, uh, ELAC Unify is going to be uh, one of the options. Uh, Andrew Jones loves to use concentric drivers. So this is a dedicated mid-range driver. It's just that the tweeter happens to be embedded right into the middle of it instead of it being a tweeter mid-range stack. Uh, but similarly, that means the woofers on either side can now be crossed over into that dedicated mid-range driver at a much lower frequency. And the mid-range driver itself acts as a waveguide for the tweeter that's embedded right in the middle of it. Uh, to give you very uniform, even dispersion out to the sides. But it also acts as a little bit of a horn, um, as you can imagine, just from the shape of it. So right. for the super wide dispersion, I might lean more towards the Twitter mid-range stack. Uh, but yeah, you'd be looking at a price point of, uh, you know, right around $450, $500 for uh, getting the ELAC unified, depending on where you're purchasing it. And then, of course, the other, you know, famously concentric driver design would be Kev 
Um, and you could look at their Q250 center, but that goes for $600. Uh, they do have the most finish options uh, over at Kef, though. So if you want something that's a walnut finish or white finish or something like that, you'd be able to get that with the Kef, but at a higher price point. So that's the type of design that I would personally look for uh, when I want you know the widest possible dispersion from a center speaker. But I would probably go with like the SPS Prime Center. I think that's going to be the most cost effective and a really good option for this particular scenario. All right, I think I have an article for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> now that I think about it, I was like, I just found it and I'm linking it. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, yeah, about the MTM design. Yeah. Mark and John. Uh, Mark says he's working slowly on adding acoustic treatments to his room a little at a time. I just found that Acoustimac is in Tampa. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that. I mean, I knew they were US. I didn't realize they were Tampa. Apparently, Kurt went and picked up his like just saved huh. the shipping by going there and picking it yeah. up so i'm cur curious to see if i can go get like some sort of tour or go talk to him but anyways yeah. so uh, mark's adding acoustic treatments to his room a little at a time does the orientation of the panels ma matter well you want them flat on the wall and not you know perpendicular <laughs> <Which would be weird. laughs> that would be a weird way of mounting panels <laughs> uh will it make any difference to the vertical horizontal diamond shaped angled etc uh Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. No. Nope. Mine are <laughs> mine were diamond shaped in here for a long time. I now currently mm -hmm. have them uh in squares for the most mm -hmm. part. I, I do have some more traditional rectangular ones. I've got two rectangular panels and everything else is a uh two by two ish square. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes hang them vertically, uh I mean as diamonds and sometimes I don't. So mm doesn't matter feel free make it whatever design you like what are the guidelines for how high or low acoustic panels should be placed um i mean i don't think it really matters except for when you're trying to catch those for those a uh, specific reflection yeah for so. specific reflections you basically want it at seated ear level you know yeah. some portion of the panel should be at seated ear doesn't level. doesn't have to be the whole thing <laughs> you know? nope. so nope. if you think about like the, the first thing. reflection points on your side walls or right behind your head Mm -hmm. it, i mean it can't mm -hmm. just be on the back wall like next to the ceiling because that mm -hmm. doesn't help you but behind your head has to be behind your head first reflection point has to be wherever the tweeter is mm -hmm. you know, basically and then um, of course if you are using panels on your front wall directly behind speakers that you've got pushed fairly close to that front wall so you're trying to use that acoustic right. panel to mitigate some of the boundary effect you'd want the panel to be you know c cover the height of the speaker <laughs> that 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 one i hope seems fairly obvious but if it's panels that are just there to cut down overall room reverberation times then it doesn't matter they yeah. can go anywhere so um if, if this is more like an open great room and you're just trying to get your reverberation times your rt60 times down to something reasonable where it doesn't sound echoey or it's hard to understand what people are saying then you can quite literally put the panels anywhere because those aren't about specific reflections it's just about cutting down overall reverberation time in the room All right so what else should it be considering as he continues to add more panels? Uh, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I just yeah. <laughs> just keep putting them up there, I guess, until it, it, everything's covered. Uh, straddle <laughs> corners. Uh, sure. I mean, I really don't think that... I just want you I mean, to put panels up. I don't yeah, really my, biggest, <laughs> my biggest thought after that is just the aesthetics, which is, you know, if, if, if you look at it and you go, well... I really painstakingly measured my RT 60 times and uh, and according to my measurements, I don't actually need diffusion. But you know what? I just really love the look of a combo panel. I'd like to have that, that visual appearance. Go for it because it's really going to be fine. <laughs> or if you want to put up panels that have images printed on them because that's going to look nicer, go for it. Um, but other than that, I mean... You know, in, in acoustically small spaces, which all of our rooms are, even open great rooms are still acoustically small spaces. They're not the size of an amphitheater. You know, they're not just the size of a concert hall. Like, you almost can't overdo it. People will say you can overdeaden the room, particularly in the treble, and to some extent that's true. If you happen to do that, if you literally covered all the surfaces of your walls in six-inch thick insulation, and you're like, gosh, it sounds really dead in here you know, just reintroducing some flat reflective surfaces and it doesn't even take that much yeah. gets you that, that you know, more lively treble sound back in there. So I'm not even 
concerned if he, if he was thinking like, can it be overdone? It's like, not really. <laughs> I'm not even really that worried about it. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Uh, John asks, and this is the same question, Mark and John were together. Because it's uh, all absorption related. Yeah. He asks, uh, when we say to aim for about 15 to 30% coverage, how do you actually calculate that figure? For example, mm -hmm. his room is about 16 by 20 by 8 feet. And mm -hmm. does the thickness of each panel factor into it? And I, I, I want to agree with Rob. I think that you have to be really, really crazy to get to the point. Like, it, you have to, it has to be to the point where people are going to wonder about you <laughs> before you get to the On point the where you side. over denon a room. I, right. I can't tell you guys, I can't stress enough. When I had my office in my Jacksonville house mm -hmm. where we purposefully built it to be a podcasting studio mm -hmm. with four inch thick panels that were at least four inches off the wall, two inches. Yeah. That was more like four inches off the wall. Uh, on these special mounts hanging from the ceiling across all the corners across the i mean in, in every they were everywhere mm -hmm. uh that room was quite dead but it was not what i considered to be too dead i did not mm -hmm. people were like oh you're going to be able to hear your heartbeat i did not it's it not an anechoic chamber it was not even <laughs> close to an anechoic chamber it was fine and i worked mm -hmm. in there and i loved it it was mm -hmm. great um that said, it was nuts how many acoustic panels I had. Sure. It was like a, a 10 by 11 foot room with like 23 four right. foot by two foot by four inch thick panels in that room. You literally could not fit any more panels right. in there. Because if I, I was going to say on the flip side, I think more people are probably concerned about not having enough. Yes. Because obviously the more panels you add, the, the more the cost is going to be. Even if you're doing a DIY, that means buying more materials. So it does still make sense to want to figure out how much surface area you're trying to cover in your room and have that range of about 15 to 30% so that you're like, okay, I, I have enough. I don't, I'm not sure too many people are worried about having too much. Yeah. Um, but, but we sort of inferred that from the previous question. Uh, but I mean, this is just, it's straight up surface area. So all you're going to do is take, you know, the dimensions of your floor and ceiling. So in this case, 16 by 20. Uh, you've got the floor and the ceiling. So it's 16 times 20 times 2. So that's 640 square feet there. Then you're going to take the two short walls. So that's 16 by 8. And then you've got two of those. So that's another 256 square feet. And then the, the two long walls. So 20 by 8 times 2. That's another 320 square feet. So you have in this, you know, uh, example of 16 by 20 by 8, uh, 1,216 square feet of surface area in this room. And if that were a, a flat out concrete room, you know, it's just everything is hard and flat and reflective. The, so the floor and the ceiling are, all four walls are, everything is just hard and flat and reflective. If we're trying to cover 15 to 30 percent of that room in absorptive material, you're you know, between 182 and 365 square feet of absorption that you'd want to bring in there. The thickness doesn't really factor into it other than the thickness determines how low in frequency mm -hmm. that absorption is going to be effective. So if you put one inch uh, you know, thick panels up there, it's still going to be the same amount of surface area, still between 182 and 365 square feet in this particular room size that we want some kind of absorption uh, covering the walls, ceiling, and floor. But if it's only one inch as thick, then it's only going to be absorbing, you know, frequencies down to what is that going to be like 1500 hertz, you know, something like that, not even the full vocal range. As long as you get two inch thick insulation, you're covering most of the vocal range from about, you know, 750 hertz upwards. But we really want like four or six inch panels in a home theater scenario to get us down into that crossover region, into that at least you know, sort of 100 hertz range. So uh, if we're talking about, you know, your sort of standard two foot by four foot uh, panels and then choosing as thick as you can, honestly, uh, you know, th that would work out to 22 to 46 panels. But that is assuming a completely reflective room. So if you have acoustic ceiling tiles, that counts. You know, mm -hmm. they're not going to be the super thickness, but that's going to count for your trouble. If you have carpet with a thick floor pad, that's going to count. It's not going to count for the base, but it's going to count somewhat. And then the other factor is if you do straddle corners, well, that covers more surface area than just the two feet by four feet. You've now created, you know, this triangular shape. So 
two feet by four feet, of course, that's covering eight square feet of surface area. If you straddle a corner with that same two foot by four foot panel, you're actually covering about 12 square feet instead of only eight. So if you went floor to ceiling in all four of your corners, now you only need like 10 to 30 more panels, and that's assuming a completely bare floor and ceiling. Right. It, it really doesn't have to be completely ridiculous. If you thought, you know what, I'm going to have floor to ceiling base traps and then about 10 panels in this room, that's really quite reasonable. And that would be enough. And that's without anything on your ceiling or floor, and you'd still be fine reverberation time wise. So I hope that, you know, sheds some light. That's how you calculate it. And, and then you don't have to go nuts. I, I'm just going to reiterate, you just, by the time you start thinking, you, you will never, you will know when you've gotten to the point where maybe you have too many panels, mm. when everybody else is looking at you like, dude, are you all right? <laughs> Something's going on. I think you've got a problem. You know? You're like the Emilda Marcos of, uh, of uh, acoustic panels, you know, way too many. <laughs> Terry. Terry upgraded his AV receiver to a Denon X6700H. He held on to his Marantz SR6011, but now it's just being used as an amplifier for his top middle speakers. That's a very big amplifier, <laughs> physically. Uh, his room is roughly 13 by 20 with two rows of seats and a slightly lowered ceiling. He's got an acoustically transparent Seymour AV screen up front, 130 inches wide, and a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. He installed a full 7.2.6 configuration with two <laughs> pairs of side surround speakers, all of his floor-level speakers, except for his surround backs, are golden ear. He's got SVS Prime satellites for the surround backs and the prime elevations overhead. His room is, a, is fully treated with GIC acoustic panels following their advice for installing bass traps and absorption panels. Yay. Uh, he's been considering changing his golden ear speakers for quite a while, while now. He knows he likes uh, Revels Concerta 2 and Performa 3 series speakers, but they can be kind of pricey. Mm -hmm. Looking at measurements and reviews, Revel speakers appear to be very neutral, unlike mm -hmm. his Golden Ear speakers. So naturally, mm -hmm. based on what we've said about them, he is considering a send. Rob's got some slightly water damaged ones. <laughs> a couple of them anyway, and hopefully not more. Oh, I'm crossing my fingers. My custom ones are okay. They should be. They weren't in the water. Yeah. Uh, he's considering the sand in hopes uh, that he can get a similar neutrality to Revel, but at lower price. He spoke with the sand's advisors, and they made the following suggestions. Keep the SVS Prime satellites for surround backs and his prime elevations for overheads. They're neutral, so that's good advice. I agree. And surround backs and overheads, uh, you, I've done I've done the critical listening, and I cannot tell. I can have quite a timbre mismatch in my surround backs and my overhead speakers, and and I'm not going to notice that they are. You know, with actual content playing, I'm not going to notice. So I fully agree that would be no problem keeping those SVSs. So he said they said to go with two pairs of HTM 200 SE speakers for a side surrounds, which are speakers that Rob recommends all the time for mm -hmm. those exact purposes. Mm -hmm. and go with three of their new sierra lx speakers which use the latest c's titan dome tweeter rather than the raw ribbon tweeter uh, well that's like somebody suggesting not to get a aluminum bike instead of a carbon bike that it, it, it people just rubs people the wrong way <laughs> uh that speaker package would meet the physical size and price points that he'd like to hit, and the Sense Advisors has just suggested the dispersion would be wider than either his Golden Ear speakers or the Sierra Rowl option, which is something he told them he wants. So Terry would just like us to weigh in. Do we think this is the right way to go? Should he still consider paying a lot more to get Revels? Should he go for Rowl ribbons instead? Um, I would be fine with what they suggest i don't think that there's any i'm i'm issue very 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 okay with that suggestion especially um, since you said you wanted wide dispersion because that the, yeah the, the, the raw ribbons can be um a little more directional yeah the raw ribbons they do have wide horizontal dispersion but they have really quite limited vertical dispersion and with your two uh, rows of seats, the back row on the riser, acoustically transparent screen up front, so you know adjusting tilt on those things would be a pain if you're trying to do that, you know, more than once. Like having the taller vertical dispersion of that dome tweeter in the Sierra LX, uh, I'm I'm really okay with that. Plus, the sound signature of the Sierra LX with the dome tweeter is a little bit closer to that HTM 200 SE, which also has a dome tweeter. Different 
film tweeters, but Ascend tunes their speakers to a very similar sound signature. So I think this is a really excellent cost-effective physical size, exactly what you want, and the characteristics that you're looking for. I, I give a huge thumbs up to this. If you were to switch over to a RAL ribbon option for your front speakers, I kind of want to get the Lunas for the surrounds because there is a difference in the timbre between the dome tweeter speakers and the RAL ribbon tweeter speakers. And, you know, across the front and into those primary side surround speakers, it's debatable. I mean, most people would probably be perfectly fine with HDM200 SEs as the surrounds with uh, RAL ribbon tweeters across the front three. But if you're being critical and doing the upgrade that you really, really want, I kind of want to get the Lunas for the surrounds, which is way more expensive than the HDM200 SEs. So, I love what Ascend told you. I don't feel that you need to pay more to get Revels. I don't feel like you need to switch over to the RAL ribbons in this instance. I think they steered you correct, and I definitely think you should keep the SVS uh, surround backs and overheads. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? I feel like we're, yeah, we're, we got like we're 15 going minutes really if fast we could. here. Yeah, well, that's fine. I we don't need to belabor this because I'm in a weird setup anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Dean. Dean would like to know, uh, first of all, you can't have a name like Dean and not have me think of Supernatural. So sorry about that, Dean. <laughs> Dean would like to know if we have a 27-inch monitor recommendation for, specifically for editing photos. He's got an x right color mun monkey. Monkey. It's a monkey. Spelled Displ strangely. <laughs> display meter for measuring and calibrating, and he doesn't care about gaming or even video all that much. This is just for photos. So mm -hmm. color, color accuracy is the main thing, but he also wants to keep the price reasonable. Uh, Rootings uh, seems to recommend a couple of <laughs> Dell Ultra Sharp models for the 27 inch size, but they also focus on video editing and seem to value 4K resolution. I mean, if you're going to be sitting really close to it, 4K makes it's like the one time I care about resolutions when you're looking at <laughs> photos really close to them. Right. Um, so, strictly for photo editing, how important is resolution? And is there a 27 inch model that, uh, monitor under $1,000 that we would point to? Again, if you are really going to be sitting there and like getting up on this monitor to yeah, nose to, to, to the monitor. Yeah. That's when resolution actually matters. Like mm. everybody else is buying 4k resolution and sitting like eight feet away from them. I'm going, mm -hmm. it's so much better. I'm like, yeah, that's not the resolution. No, no, it's the 4k. The 4k makes a big difference, dude. You haven't seen a pixel in 20 years. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> So, I mean, like the top choice here is probably going to be one of the Asus Pro Art displays, but they are not hitting the price point right. that you want to hit. Those are in the multi thousands of dollars and they're meant for professionals. Um, you know, so performance wise, they're sort of beyond reproach, but uh, they're not hitting your other criteria <laughs> that you want to get with the Asus Pro Arts. Um, the the Dell Ultra Sharps that that uh, Artings recommends, those are perfectly fine choice uh I, I have no beef with going with one of those you know the measurements are right there um if however you wanted to bring the price point down uh like i don't consider resolution to be the be all end all i'm more concerned about the color accuracy and specifically the ability to have very accurate different color profiles uh, because you don't just want srgb that's kind of what our team's focused on because they were worried about video editing so in video editing, you want that very accurate sRGB uh, color gamut because it's going out to YouTube or it's going out to streaming and you want to make sure that it's going to match up with what they're expecting. And they're all working in the sRGB color range unless it's specifically HDR. Uh, but for everything standard dynamic range, they're worried about sRGB. When you're getting into photos, well, then you want to be able to have a very accurate Adobe RGB. You want to be able to have a very accurate, you know, CMYK equivalent so that it looks the way it's going to look when it gets printed. Um, and to do that, I want to focus on a monitor that really is specifically about photo editing and not video editing. Uh, so it, at a reasonable price point for the 27-inch size, uh, BenQ has a photography monitor. It is, you know, 300 nits. It's not for HDR grading. This is for standard dynamic range grading. But for when it's photos, you know, that's fine. We're not worried about HDR images. We're, we're worried about having really accurate colors. And that's where uh, this model is the SW270C. Uh, so the 0C is sort of the... the the uh, series number that you're actually looking for there, but the SW270C from BenQ, um, where it sort of excels above uh, any other monitors that are under $1,000 is that it does have 
multiple different color profiles, and it has a hardware level lookup table that you can adjust, which is a really rare thing to find on monitors at this sort of price point. You don't have to rely just on software calibration. You can actually calibrate the monitor itself uh, to have really, really accurate colors with a full lookup table. And you can't really beat that when you're talking about color accuracy and has the capability to get out to the full Adobe RGB or 99% of Adobe RGB color gamut. Um, so I think that's the one I would point you to. It is 1440p resolution rather than full 2160p uh, 4K resolution. But I would be willing to trade that little bit lower resolution because you're still talking 27 inch screen size. So 1440p at 27 inches is still going to look really sharp. It's going to be very hard to see an individual pixel. You would literally have to put your nose mm -hmm. on the screen. So for the color, for the calibration capabilities built in the hardware, I'd, I'd look at that BenQ, the uh, SW270C. There you go. Very exciting. Lior. 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 It's got to be Lior. It's got to be Lior. Lior, was, uh, Lior has B&W speakers up front that are over 20 years old now. His 603 S2 towers, which he wants to keep and has no intention of replacing right now. And the matching CC6 center. His The tweeter in the center has died. So he got in touch with BMW, but they informed him that they no longer have any compatible replacement tweeters for that particular speaker model. It was suggested he could try a current HGM6 S2 center if he's willing to buy an entirely new center speaker but since there have been over 20 years of development in between Lior isn't sure it'll be good enough timbre match you could try to find a second hand cc6 even if it's just for parts to get a replacement tweeter what would we advise uh honestly there's the place in town called simply speakers it's mm -hmm. in it's in town i've driven by them i've gone in, i've gone in there and talked to them years ago before the pandemic uh and that's what they do they they replace they they repair like vintage speakers mostly, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they'll repair anything. I would call them and see mm. what they recommend if they if they mm -hmm. have. Not that they're going to be any more knowledgeable than uh, B and W is, but B and W has no vested interest in you <laughs> doing anything other than buying more stuff from them. So if they don't have something to replace it with, they don't have any way of uh, any motivation to help you find an. Uh, like an aftermarket or a compatible tweeter with a similar dispersion and similar mm. sound. Uh, because if they don't stock it and they can't sell it, why are they going to help you? So yeah. that I don't know what that noise was, but that's... Uh, <laughs> Something fell over. That's I, can, I can hear that. So for once, it wasn't me, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's that's what I would do. I would call... Simp and I'll try to find the, the phone number uh, or the contact okay. information. So as far as looking for a used um, one of the 20-year-old uh, uh, speaker model, I mean, of course, that's going to be a bit of a crapshoot, um, you know, but finding one that at least has a functional tweeter, that, that seems entirely possible. It's, it's certainly going to be less expensive than uh, getting a brand new HTM6 S2. Uh, so I'm not against that idea. It's just you know, whether or not you'll be able to find a, a viable one on the used market going to depend on where you are and how far you're, you're willing to search. Um, but yeah, if you, I think maybe the concern is like, you know, if you were to just get the HTM6, is that going to be a decent timbre match uh, to your 20 year old towers? You know, over the 20 years, BMW has, you know, refined their sound, changed it a little bit like that. I would definitely say though, that you're going to have a much better chance of matching uh, the sound signature of your BNW towers, even though they're 20 years old, with a BNW current center uh, besides any other brand. Uh, I wouldn't point yeah. you at, at any other brand to try and get a decent timbre match to your older uh, BNW tower speakers. I would certainly stick with BNW if you're getting something new. Um, so I think it sort of falls into the question of how critical are you <laughs> of your listening? Because one of the things that you know, Tom has mentioned many times, and I totally agree with, even if you had three literally identical speakers, the one that's in the center, if you're hypercritically listening to timbre, is going to have a slightly different timbre from the front left and the front right speakers just because of positioning, just because of placement. Not any fault of the speaker, three literally identical speakers, but that center is still going to sound slightly different in its timbre due to the positioning and the placement in your room. So if in your previous setup, you know, your your CC6 was not literally the identical speaker as your towers. If if you had that set up in there, like I've always been happy with the timbre match. I've ne it never 
noticed that, that, that there was any sort of difference in a sound panning across my front soundstage, I would venture to say that switching for the HTM6 is going to sound fine to you because BMW has not changed their sound signature so much. In fact, they haven't changed it very much at all um, in, the, in the previous 20 years that if you were completely happy with how things sounded with the old one, I think there's a very good chance you'd be perfectly fine timbre-wise putting in the HTM6. On the other hand, if you had always said that, you know what, that CC6 sounds a little bit different from the towers, and that was always a thing in there, then the HTM6 is probably going to sound even a little bit more different <laughs> because mm. the HTM6 isn't going to sound identical to the CC6. And I would warn you against uh, just buying another center that, like, say, say somebody's like, oh, I've got an, a CC6, mm-hmm. the woofer is torn. But, you know, so I'll sell it to you for like 50 bucks or something right, like right, that. Right, right, You know, and you're like, oh, I'll just take the tweeter out. You know, there were, it should just be a drop-in mm-hmm. replacement. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> there, there's a reason why, um, you know, batches were, you know, kind of made together and right. that sort of thing. There's a lot of times where uh, there are differences between, you know, the, the drivers and stuff like that. So just, you know, hot swapping a... a a tweeter out of an older one mm. or a d- damaged one, there's just no guarantee it's going to play exactly nicely with right. the tweeter that you've damaged. I'd also like to know how he damaged the dang thing too, because you want to make sure you don't do it again, mm. uh, whatever that was. I mean, right. it's just like a cat or somebody <laughs> pushed on it or yep. whatever. But if you're playing it too loud, there's no guarantee you're not going to be right back in the same situation. Yeah. But we're going to agree, if you're keeping those towers, stick with BMW in some form or fashion. We're, yeah. we're not going to point you to any other brand. All right. Well, that's it for this week. Mm-hmm. We have uh, answered all the questions that I guess not all the questions since the last two weeks, but all the questions we're going to answer. So yep. hopefully like if it. you have, I think via email, you... I got everybody. So, you know what? That, okay. that blanket thing, I very well might have missed somebody. Yes. I was not focusing all of my attention onto podcast emails. So please, if you did not receive a direct email answer from questions uh, from last week, if you have written into us at any time and have not heard your name in question, on the podcast, please send it again. We are by no means attempting to ignore uh, anybody's questions. So send it in again if it uh, has not been answered by us. That's right. So if, yes, so that's it. So I uh, want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, to support the podcast. So Julian Ari went to avrent.com, clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and sent us PayPal donations. And we want to thank our 139 patrons over at patreon.com. For sure, Julian Ari, thank you very much for the PayPal donations. And patreon.com slash podcast is where you can go to make an automatic monthly donation. So big thanks to our 139 patrons over there. We want to thank James for the sizable contribution yeah. to rob's rebuild his uh, home theater fund thank and you thank Gurinder you James. for sending uh, a movie code to rob yeah thank you gorinda that was very nice and we want to thank those who have thanked us for keeping the podcast going including jules mark michael and nick yes indeed jules mark michael and nick thank you very much for those notes of gratitude to us for keeping the podcast going even if we missed a week but that was not our intention so uh, thank you so much big big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions do keep sending in your questions we are here and we will answer them it might be audio only for the next couple of weeks but uh, there will be a v rant podcast that's right av rant uh question at avrant.com is where you send your questions for av rant i'm tom andry and i'm rob h now stay in and listen to something